Greetings. This is our seventh lesson out of Unit 2 for Sunday, January the 13th, 2019. And our lesson from Unit 2, Loving God by Trusting Christ. Our Sunday School lesson is titled, Humility in Love. And this is out of our Faith Pathway Study Manual. And if we are referring to our standard lesson commentary, then our lesson is Submit to God. Our devotional reading uh, is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 through 35. Our background scripture is James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And our printed passage is also James, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 10. And our key verse is the fourth chapter of James, verse 8, which reads, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Our lesson's aims are understand James' teaching about the source of conflicts and his prescription for avoiding them. Repent of attitudes and behaviors that keep adults mired in conflicts and disputes, develop ways to draw near to God in humble submission. And our lesson is a well of information, uh, of corrective means, and it is just full of uh, identifying discrepancies, the nature and the seat of arguments and fights and disagreements, uh, but it also gives us insight on the corrective measures that need to be in place so that we resolve these matters. Now, the blessing of our lesson is, is wouldn't those that are sincere about serving God and those that are sincere about uh, walking the walk and not just talking the talk, but wouldn't it be a blessing for somebody to uh, give insight into the problem matters of your life and not just identify the problem and complain about the problem, but also cite your problem, identify the nature, its origin, and then also provide matters or provide means by which you can resolve your problem and get back onto the right path and then steer your way away from the attractions or away from the things that pull you back into those problematic areas. And that is the beauty and the blessing of our lesson uh, today for January the 13th, Lesson 7. It not James does not just uh, point out where we erred. Uh, James doesn't just uh, talk about our mistake, but James identifies the mistake. James then explains to us, here is how you got entangled into your problem area. But here is uh, the pitfalls. This is what allows some people 
to get attracted or entangled in the problem and not be able to escape. But here is a way for you to get out of the problem. Here is a way for you to escape it. And here is a way to keep you free from being entangled in or back into that problematic area again. And that is what we actually need in this walk of life, serving the true and living and real God. James opens our lesson up with the seat of the problem. For he proposes the question and then provides the answer. And he says, where do the wars and fightings among you come from? Are they not even from your own members? The lust that is present within us. Uh, our fleshly desires. Where do these conflicts emerge from? Do they come from some outside source? Uh, is there some kind of uh, insuance of it? Uh, is the does it come from some uh, outside entity? Is there somebody that we can point the finger at? And we can say that you caused this war, you caused this bickering, this fighting. Uh, one of the things that is cited in our lesson is, is that uh, this uh, bickering, these conflicts, these uh, disagreements, um, it occurred among the believers and uh, the enemy crept within. So when it talked about uh, even of your lust that war in your members, it's not actually identifying uh, members of our assembly, members of our church, but physical members. Now, what takes place among us as individuals, uh, how outside influences and attractions uh, find place within our own selves and uh, become a part of our individual desires and wants and our own uh, machination, uh, our own problems in our, in our mind, it can then affect the members of our assembly. But what James identifies here is, is first identify where the seat of the problem evolves from. It comes from us. So we don't have to point the finger. A lot of times they always say when you point the finger, there's at least three pointing back at us. Uh, so when we point the finger, we uh, first have to recognize that it starts with us. When we allow uh, different uh, conflicting influences, uh, no matter how uh, subtle, they may be as they approach us. Uh, we are not always at our best, uh, but when we are overwhelmed or when we are succumbed uh, to subtle suggestions, and they can affect us in various ways, uh, we might feel as though we were overlooked. Uh, we might be offended by uh, something that was said and felt it was directed towards us. Uh, and whoever made the statement wasn't even thinking about us, wasn't looking in our direction. Uh, but we felt that they put us on front street. Or it could be over uh, monetary issues. Uh, it could be um, 
just uh, assignments uh, in the ministry. Somebody else was chosen instead of me. Or it could be uh, futile uh, disagreements. Uh, I just don't like the way that they dress. I don't like the way that they talk. I don't like where they live. And, and we have all of these worldly influences that affect us individually, one to another. What can entangle one person does not entangle another. But what appears that one person is strong because they aren't overcome by a particular approach, then we find that they have a weakness and they are attracted by something else. And so first we have to recognize when there is turmoil, when there is conflict, when there are commotions going on, what part have we as individuals played in the inception of that entering in to us as individuals and then spreading from us into the larger uh, collective membership? Now we are affecting others. So, um, but when that uh, was lifted, uh, here, as I said earlier, uh, James doesn't just identify the problem, but James also gives us a uh, way out. He, he explains to us that when these things occur, uh, here is how you should respond to it. And this will equip you and enable you to bypass uh, certain uh, uh, little inceptions here that could lead to big problems. But if you put these things in front of those things, sometimes we have to put other things in front of our own desires. And the scripture refers to it as, as our own lust. But sometimes we have to put bigger things ahead of ourselves. But one of the uh, lessons commentaries to equip us on this is uh, in the uh, book of Titus, the uh, third chapter, the eighth verse. Um, Titus chapter three will begin at the eighth verse. And it reads, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So these things aren't destructive. These things don't tear down. These things build up. It says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. It's not good always to engage in talking about here is how it's done. This is the way that you should have done this. And don't you know that the word of God says such and so and so and so. Sometimes that's viewed as pumping oneself up. Sometimes that's viewed as though you think you know it all. It is better that we uh, demonstrate our uh, talk. Uh, there's a scripture in First John, I believe it's uh, the third chapter, we will address it later, but um, it's better that we walk it than just talk it. Uh, but it goes on in verse 9 and it says, for they are unprofitable and useless. When we engage in those discussions uh, trying to uh, not necessarily impress somebody that we know all the correct ways and such and how this should, here's what you should have done and so forth and so on. Uh, those things are not profitable. They're useless. They kind of engage and enrage people when they hear us uh, approach it in that manner. It says, though, to reject a divisive man after the first and second Ammunition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned.
Now, sometimes we have to surmise the situation. Uh, we have to look at what's needed, not what we just what, not just what we want to say, but what's actually needed. And if we find that we ourselves are uh, unable to provide what's actually needed, then we recognize. Uh, some of our own inadequacies or shortcomings. But uh, then we should be try and lead them and provide them where they can receive the help that's needed. Now, verse 2 talks about the conditions of our desires, self-seated desires. It talks about that we lust and we have not. So we desire certain things, but we still don't obtain them. It says that we kill and we desire to have. Sometimes we think that eliminating the uh, obstacle or the opposition is the answer. Uh, but then we find out that just by eliminating people and discounting people and disregarding people, we still see that it doesn't provide what we thought we were going to receive by moving someone else out of the way. That we still didn't obtain that higher divine good that we were searching for. Uh, if we still didn't get it by trying to uh, achieve it or accomplish it, by devilish or ungodly manners and ways. But it goes on and it says that um, we fight and we still don't have because we don't ask right. And then sometimes we go through the formality, through the practice of asking as though we can fool God because we just went through the formalities. So it says we ask and we receive not because we ask amiss, as though God doesn't recognize that our request is not sincere, is that we're not praying upon the repentant heart. Uh, we're just going through the formalities as though if now I did what uh, scripture said I was supposed to do. Now, where is my stuff? I prayed. I still didn't get nothing. Well, it has to be sincere. And and we can't think that uh, the divine God is equal to the uh, inadequate man. God is not a man that he should lie. But here again... Uh, James doesn't leave us helpless. James again brings up, now last week we were talking about love and the expressions of love and, and what happens when we love. Uh, here in 1 John 3, and I'm going to start it uh, at the 16th verse, but 1 John 3 and 16, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, speaking of Christ, uh, which we are to be uh, exemplifying the life of Christ. And it says, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for others. But whoever has this world's goods and sees another in need and shuts up his heart, from him, how does the love of God abide in that person? Then it says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So what is required of us is, is that uh, we don't just always seek. If we would seek what God seeks, then we would get an abundance far and beyond our expectations. We would get what we think we're being denied, but we would get that and above if we would adhere and take on the mannerism of God instead of the lust of ourselves. Now, John spoke of the world and James in the fourth verse tells us that we were an adulterous people. 
adulterers and adulteresses, uh, known that the friendship of the world is an enemy. It is divisiveness with God. It is a wedge. It separates us from God. And whoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, um, when the phrase of an adulterer is used, you know, we recognize this in uh, marriages that a partner in the marriage seeks uh, companionship somewhere else and when it is used in this text in James and scripture it identifies us as individuals and collectively there is a reference also that takes us uh, to uh, Hosea uh, chapter 1 and 2 but it identifies that a nation can become an adulterous nation when it chooses worldly manner, worldly behavior, worldly companionship over and above its uh, link and its uh, attachment unto God. And so when we put worldliness above God, then we have uh, placed ourselves in the position of an adulterer unto God. Now, now James brings another point up when we talk about uh, putting the world above God. Uh, he identifies that this is a certain expression of a spirit that somehow has become a part of us uh, in verses 5 and in verse 6. Well, verse 5, and it talks about, do you think that the scripture says this in vain? The spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy. Now, of course, we know that this is not talking about the spirit of God. Uh, we also know that in John uh, 14th and 16th chapter, it talks about Christ says that he will leave, but he will send us the comforter. And that comforter is the spirit of God, and he will teach us all things. So we know that it's not the spirit of God that causes us to fall into these pitfalls. And so that we distinguish between the two. In your spare time, uh, just to identify the expression of this alien spirit compared to the spirit of God, we should re read just for edification the uh, Galatians, the fifth chapter, uh, which identifies the spirit of flesh and lust compared to the spirit and the fruit of of the spirit. So uh, from Galatians 5 starting at 17 all the way through to 26 just to give ourselves a comparison on what is this alien spirit compared to the spirit of God. But even though these uh, expressions of a bad spirit and ungodly spirit are lifted. In verse 6, James tells us that God gives us grace and that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And uh, we know that there's a scripture that tells us, I believe in Proverbs, that pride goes before the fall. Uh, God does not like those that beat their chests and uh, uh, try to exalt themselves. He hates those that are self-exalted. That's uh, not a expression that is welcomed uh, by God. And so uh, he says that we are to resist being proud. And he gives us grace. Now, there's a songwriter that uh, spoke of two gifts that God uh, gives to us. 
and they referred to him as twins, and he was saying it was grace and mercy, the unmerited gift that was given to all of us, grace and then mercy, the pardon that was afforded unto us. And so even though we may have pitfalls, uh, grace and the mercy of God is still available unto us and is renewed every day. It doesn't run out. Every day we receive a new slate of grace and mercy. So as we uh, come to a close, James ends by affirming unto us that if we would draw nigh, if we would draw close to God, that he would draw close to us. If our hands would be clean, if we would repent, if we would not just uh, be here and there, double-minded, over here serving and over there serving. Um, man cannot serve two masters. He must choose good over evil, God over Satan. And so if uh, James tells us that um, if you reach out to God, he is there, he will accept us. But we have to be uh, sorrowful in our actions. We can't just come in proud, but we need to like uh, recognize that we have harmed our relationship with God and brought harm unto ourselves. So when James tells us to draw nigh unto God, my mind goes to uh, the seventh chapter of Matthew, uh, which tells us to uh, seek the Lord, and we will find. In fact, it starts off by saying, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and we will find. Knock, and the door will be open. And so, God is always ready and receptive unto us. Uh, he knows our shortcomings, and, and he knows those moments when we like to think more of ourselves than we should. So um, there's the story in uh, the 18th chapter of Luke of the Pharisee, he was so proud of himself. He went before the Lord. He was beating his chest. He made comparisons about things that were comfortable for him to do. They didn't require a sacrifice. Uh, and then he made the comparison that he was not like this sinner, this tax collector. But in the parable of the story, Christ said that the tax collector went away from the submission of prayer that the tax collector was the one that was sincere. That was the one that prayed on bended knees of a repented heart. He acknowledged the tax collector, but not the one who didn't mourn, who didn't have any sorrow, no remorse for his own actions. So it ends the text, uh, the scripture, and it, it talks about that the exalted shall be humbled. But the humbled will be exalted by God. So as always, we pray the blessings of God upon you. And we hope that something that was said will bring joy to your heart and will be an uplift for you to keep us all on that path of righteousness on this journey of life. God bless you.